There's a big debate about who is God. In fact, if you ask 10 different people about God, you hear 10 different opinions. And it's not about whether you're right or I'm right or he's right or she's right. It doesn't matter who's right or wrong. I think what is most pressing in today's uh, society is have you experienced God? And what's it like to experience Him? That's why in this series, Check Him Out, we're looking at three things. I would call it nothing, something, everything. Did you hear me? Nothing, something, everything. So it, it, I could tell you something that at first it looks like nothing, but really it is something that has everything to do with your future, with your happiness, with your stability, with who you are, with how you perceive the world and make a difference. We're going to talk about God. Instead of talking in a debate format, you're right, I'm right, I want you to check them out for yourself. Experience God. Check Him out. Tonight I want to talk to you about another one of Jesus' Talmudins, one of His disciples. You remember how it was that a rabbi would call a Talmudin a disciple back then? Lech acharai. Can you say that? Lech acharai. Say it correctly now. Lech. It's not Spanish. Lech acharai. No. Lech acharai. Come. Follow me. And a rabbi would call only one disciple. But when Jesus began his rabbinical ministry, he called 12 of them. And then, and then he, he preached and would invite thousands at a time. Take up your cross. Lech acharai. Come follow me too. Pretty soon all of Galilee followeth after him. That's one powerful rabbi. He didn't settle for one disciple. There were thousands of um, powerful stuff. He didn't always make them happy. There were times, one of the most saddest uh, passages of Scripture is when several of his disciples argued with him about his flesh and blood. He says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood or you will not be saved. Who can listen to this? His disciples said, these were not the twelve, but others. And he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no part with me in glory. And many of his disciples ceased to follow him that day. And that still happens now in, uh, in this day and age that people suddenly get frustrated and they stop following the Messiah. There's always a place for us in the kingdom of heaven because his kingdom is not like a worldly political kingdom. His kingdom is about salvation. It's about forever. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee sees two men fishing. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew. They were fishermen. And he said unto them, Lech acharai. Come, follow me. And they immediately left their nets. And they followed him. You know, for all the criticism we level against some of these guys with big mouths, these guys followed them. That means anybody with an attitude problem can be a disciple of Jesus. See, when I was little, wait a second, I still am. When I was littler, <laughs> I couldn't resist it. When I was littler than I am now, and I mean little, how old are you, Sarah? I'm 14. Are you serious? <laughs> when I was little, I grew up thinking that God was severe and that God is just waiting to punish us because he has a book of memory where he keeps a record of everything. And I mean everything. My mother told me not to go to the street. This is in L.A. So where did I run? to the street as if she said, please run as quickly as you can to the street because it's a child thing to challenge mom, especially dad. <laughs> I don't know why, it's human nature. My mother said, don't go to the street. So I ran toward the street and little me, I was of course far younger. I was seven, eight years old, which means I was really, really little. Squirrels marveled, he looks just like us. 
there was a park nearby. It's the only place to see squirrels in L.A. I was running as fast as my little legs would carry me. You know that one tree that's growing along the sidewalk and it's picked up the sidewalk, the concrete is up like this, and they haven't fixed it in the last 10 years. It's just sitting there like that. I didn't see it. I was running as fast as I could, and suddenly I kicked it. And there was silence as I flew. <laughs> and when this little boy lands face first into the concrete, <laughs> my mother does what any normal mom does. She ran, picked me up, and of course my wind had been knocked out. <laughs> you know what's going to happen when I catch my breath, right? And when I bellowed out a piercing scream that had every grandmother for three blocks wondering, there's a child hurt somewhere nearby because that piercing scream that only pain can bring about for a child. And you know, for a kid, the moment you've skinned your arm and your elbow and your cheek and your nose and, and you see blood, the scream times 10 decibels such as has never been heard by humankind. I'm screaming, and as I'm screaming in pain, I can hear my auntie in the distance saying, you see, God punished you for being such a disobedient little boy. And I used to look him to the heavens. Man, he must have really been mad because he pushed me hard. <laughs> so you... You have to be careful what you teach a child. A child will believe you. Be careful. Don't lie to a child. Jesus is very sad when you're a bad little girl. Be careful. A child will believe you. Jesus is not very sad when children are normal and learning to live and experiment with life. They're innocent. That's why you're there to guide them. Don't lie to your child and tell them that Jesus is sad. We're talking about a billion children at the same time being children. That's a very depressed Jesus clinically going off the edge if all those billion moms are telling the truth. So don't lie to your kid and your kid will believe you. <laughs> I don't want to make him sad. Don't be sad. I didn't mean it. You're teaching your child guilt. You're teaching them that it's an angry Messiah. So maybe he's not a Messiah. A Savior can't be that angry with me all the time. There's a big difference. Now, sweetheart, you can put away your socks. I'm giving you one last opportunity. Now, that's very persuasive. Now, in my day and age, we saw a belt. Just the visual of this, uh, you know, this little visual effect. It was very helpful toward understanding what consequences could be. I don't remember being whooped too many times, but I remember when I was really little, I had to go find my own switch. Go get me a switch so I can whoop you. Should I get the thin one or the thick one? <laughs> See, now kids have child protective services to back them up, but back then, these agencies did not exist. We were on our own. <laughs> Be careful what you tell a child. He's the Messiah, not the killer. He's coming soon to take you home, not to destroy you, but to, so you can live forever. Do you want to live forever? Check him out. See, the power of an experience for Peter was incredible because immediately he left his nets and followed him. He left his career. How is he going to pay his rent next month? His mother was sick, but he's been asked to be a disciple. What an honor! And as they hang out with this rabbi, they begin to realize he was no normal rabbi. His yoke was different. His interpretation of the scriptures, it was completely different than other rabbis. His teaching was simple to understand. The simplest peasant who'd never been to school a day in their life could understand what he taught. And the doctors of the law, the guys from the Sanhedrin, they can understand what he was saying and from the most scientific perspectives. No matter where Jesus preached or taught, Everybody was like, whoa. And Peter was there. 
this is no ordinary rabbi. We got some serious Talmudinian going on here. I had never realized. And then it began. Peter thought, I'm going to protect him. There's always people who think they can help Jesus. Remember, it's the other way around. He wants to help us. Well, I thought I can help the Lord. No, 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 no. He could take care of himself. But Peter didn't know that yet. What was Peter's issue? He had a big mouth. I know you've never met people that way. Don't look at me that way. <laughs> you've never seen my mouth anyway. <laughs> Peter was one of those who engaged his mouth, and then he engaged his brain. Talk first, think later. And those people always put their foot in their mouth. That's why their mouth is so big. It's a size 12D shoe that's constantly in there, so their mouth gets very big. And the problem with Peter is that he would use a lot of cursing and swearing. He was a fisherman. He was not a refined man. And he is now a disciple of Jesus, yet he is not demonstrating perfection. He's only showing humanity. Yet as he's following him day by day, he can't believe what he's hearing. And he decides, I'm going to protect him. And so one day, Jesus was teaching, and some mothers saw him. There she is. Let's bring our children. I want him to bless my child. Let's take our kids to him. So they started coming with their little children. What do little children do in the sanctuary? They make noise. <laughs> yeah, it's mine that they're talking in church. <gasps> they're children. Don't get angry. You did it too. Did you forget? Well, I don't want my children to do what I did. They're going to do everything you did as a child. It's once they become adolescents that you want to protect them from what you did. But child is child. That's why you're there, to enjoy the ride with them, to show them the way. The power of discovery for a child is incredible when a parent is patient. These ladies brought their little ones to Jesus. This was outside, but they were making noise. And who spoke first? Peter, ladies, what's all this noise and irreverence the rabbi is teaching? We have a mother's room for this. I don't know what it is about mother's rooms. I guess they have their place. In my churches, I don't mind if a baby cries in church. That means a young couple has come to church today. I don't want to lock them away. Now, I'm not, I'm not putting it down. Don't worry. If you have a mother's room at your church, use it. But I'm telling you right now, if a kid's crying, that means a young couple has come to church. Praise the Lord. When the church is deathly quiet because there are no young couples in church, it feels much worse. I, I'd rather have a crying kid. And remember, that poor woman hasn't slept all week because she's got two of them. And they take turns crying all night. And she's getting up, and she tells her husband, Oh, sweetheart, can't you? I, you know I have to get up to work at 6. <laughs> and those are the guys who go tell their friends, Yeah, my wife doesn't work. Ooh. La verdad no peca, pero incomoda. The, the truth doesn't sin. It just makes you uncomfortable. You see, that woman hasn't slept, and then one of them got sick. And every time she tried to catch a little cat nap in the afternoon, the baby would cry again. She's been going day and night, day and night, only cat naps of 10, 15 minutes, two or three times a night. That poor girl finally shows up to church. What condition is she in? What's your name? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't slept in three years. But I love my children. <laughs> I love my children. And she comes and parks herself in a pew at your church. <laughs> I want to hear something good. And then her kid's crying. Does she hear the kid? No, because she's been hearing them day in, day out for three weeks without sleeping. So she doesn't even hear it anymore. She's enjoying the sermon. And people are looking at her. I never. In the house of God. Instead of passing judgment on that young woman, go help her with her child that she may hear the word of God and find some rest in the house. Don't send her off to a... There's a mother's room. You. 
and she goes back there to sleep with her baby. <laughs> Poor thing. Help her out. Be merciful to your families. Aren't they the ones you want to come to church? Well, Peter said, Hey, don't bring those children the master's teaching. They're interrupting the master. He was telling these ladies off, and they were like, What? We've seen guys like you before. Finally, Jesus interrupts, Peter, Peter, bring the kids. But master, bring me the kids. Hear me, come here. And he sits his little boy on his lap. You see this kid, everybody? This child, the kingdom of heaven belongs to this child. Huh? In fact, if you want to be part of my kingdom, you will become like this child. Suddenly, Peter's tantrum turns into an object lesson for everyone. Peter gets all embarrassed. Oops. I was elected deacon. I thought I was helping. And Jesus makes it clear that the way this child loves his parents, you can love God. The way this child trusts his parents, you can trust God. My mommy cooks better than your mommy. And once my daughter was arguing with another kid next door, my daddy's caught a bigger fish than your daddy, because he knows I like fishing. My daddy's caught a bigger fish than your, no, -uh, my dad's caught a bigger fish than you. They were arguing about who's caught the bigger fish, which dad, because their kids believe their dads and moms can do anything. Imagine if we believed our God can do anything anything I saw a dog coming at me once I was this tall the dog was this tall for me it was Tyrannosaurus Rex I didn't know that it was a puppy Doberman Pinscher with its stub wagging I didn't see the stub wagging I just saw a dog as big as me easily a stallion of some kind coming to protect the herd and it's coming toward me and as it knocks me down and begins to lick me, I am screaming bloody murder because I'm convinced he's preparing me for supper. <laughs> At that moment of my most abject horror, I feel two strong arms that pick me up. He was my daddy, Miku. It was I was holding my daddy's neck. <laughs> Fifty dogs could come, I don't care, man. I'm in my daddy's arms. You see, a child believes. They don't just accept it as truth. They really believe. Imagine if we believed in God with the same intensity that he will keep his promises, that he will bless me, that he will save me. Peter learned a lesson. On another occasion, they were trying to get over to Galilee as quickly as possible. It was a couple of days' walk. They didn't have Adidas or, you know, Nikes and other companies. They had sandals that you cut out of a piece of uh, camel, you know, leather. And you got leather straps going all over the place. So we're talking about blisters and places you never imagined down there. And so you've walked and you're on your way and as they're going through one of the villages, suddenly a man says, he's coming. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Is he here? Is he here? Yes. Oh, Jesus, son of David, have mercy. He heard that the Messiah was walking by. Son of David, have mercy. And, and who stepped up first? Peter, hey, hey, don't bother the master. He doesn't have time for you. Excuse me, we're in a hurry. By then, Jesus, Peter, ay, Peter, que traes tu hombre que no quieres entender. Sir, what is it that I can do for you? I want my sight. I want to see. Jesus said, yes. He grabbed some dirt, did the strangest thing. I know, but that's what it says in the scriptures. <laughs> it's pretty gross. I hope you're not eating back home. And then he makes this mud, and he applies it. <laughs> 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 
I think you need to go wash your face. <laughs> I think the Lord had a sense of humor, don't you agree? <laughs> but now this man could respond in faith as he found his way to the pool. And he obeyed the Messiah as you and I can. As he washed his face, he can perceive light. And because of the perception of light, he can perceive the refraction of color. And he could see! Peter again learned from the Master. This just kept going on and on. One day they're trying to get through a town because one of the synagogue leaders, Jairus, his 12-year-old daughter was desperately ill. Please, Master, please. She's dying. And they're running through town. And you, you could try racing Jesus, but this man was a carpenter. He was buffed. He could run, too. Jesus could teach a mean P.E. class if he felt like it. Remember that P.E. teacher made you run 10 laps and then soccer for 45 minutes? And you were the baseball team? <laughs> These guys think it's the Marines or something. And so Jesus is physically running through town with a desperate Jairus from the synagogue trying to get to Jairus' house when the crowds hear that Jesus is coming and they throng the streets. And Jesus is trying to get them, make room for the Master, make room for the Master, as the disciples tried to be Secret Service Junior. And they're opening a way, and Jesus is trying to get through, and people are poking and pulling, and, then, and all of a sudden, Jesus stops. All right, who touched me? The crowd freaks out. Excuse me? And who spoke? Peter. Master. See, he, he wanted to help Jesus, remember? He's the guy who wants to help him, because sometimes he just doesn't look right. I need to help him out. There's always somebody who thinks they can help Jesus. Master, people are poking you, pushing you, pulling you, shoving you, and you ask who touched me. Now, had I been Jesus, I would have looked at Peter like, who do you think you are talking to me like that? I'm the boss around here. <laughs> but fortunately, he wasn't on my staff. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, no. no. That's not true. I have a staff of six, and I've never treated them that way. You can ask them yourself. <laughs> I don't want to work for him anyway. It's true. I haven't been mean to my people. Anyway. But Jesus was, Peter, I know what you're talking about, but this touch was different. See, Jesus was from Nazareth. They even talked differently there. I felt virtue come out of me. And the girl who had touched him, I did it. <laughs> I did it, but I don't care. You guys can be mad if you want. I've been sick for years. This woman had suffered with a horrendous endometriosis for years and years and years. Pain, weakness, loss of iron, anemia. No one would marry her. Doctors had given up, and Jesus was coming through town. I wasn't going to wait for anybody if the Messiah is coming. I don't care what I have to do. She dove for him. She didn't care who trampled on her. She reached out and touched the very hem of his garment, and Jesus felt power come out of hey, Stop. Who touched me? But I did. <laughs> I did. Woman, go in peace. Your faith has saved you. Thank you. If you all excuse me. <laughs> she took off. Happily, joyfully, a complete woman because she met the Messiah. Have you met him? Or do you just know about him? Can you defend him in scripture? Or can you defend him in your life? You must experience him. The first step toward experiencing him is the forgiveness of your sins. Have you experienced forgiveness? 
in your life. That's the first experience you have with the Messiah, that he actually goes out of his way to save you. So they left, and Jairus' servant came running. Uh, don't bother the master anymore. Your little girl just died. No, she was only 12 years old. No, my little girl, oh my God, Lord, what has happened? And Jesus takes this broken man who just heard that his little girl died. All things are possible to him that believes. Okay, I believe. Then let's go. And they go to Jairus' house and there were mourners wailing outside. By tradition, she must be buried within 24 hours. Jesus says, let me back there. She's not dead. She sleeps, he tells his disciples. And some of the mourners overheard him and laughed him to scorn. He takes three of his disciples, and Peter's one of them, with the two parents. And they go back in there, and he takes this little girl by the hand. Awake, Micha. Awake. She sits up. Mommy. And they scramble and they reheat the burritos in the microwave. <laughs> she hasn't eaten in a while, so we're going to celebrate and eat the fatted burrito. <laughs> I mean, they rejoiced. That's what I do when I rejoice. I mean, come on. It's, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, just trying to imagine it from my perspective. And so now there's rejoicing and Peter learns another lesson. Well, after some time, everywhere they went, Peter would open his big mouth first, embarrass the entire crew, and Jesus would patiently, instead of punishing his disciple, help him learn from his mistakes. God is not as anxious to punish you as he's anxious for you to learn from your mistakes. Yes, the consequences of your sin are inevitable, but if you jump off a bridge, what's the consequence? Death, if it's a real big bridge or a broken ankle or broken leg if it's not a big bridge. Jump off the roof and, you know, there's all kinds of consequences. That, that comes with sin, consequences. But God is still wanting to reconcile His children unto Himself. And so Peter kept learning. Finally, Jesus asked them one day, Who do men say that I am? And the disciples said, Well, some say that you're Jonah. Others say that you're Elijah risen from the dead or John the Baptist. Yes, 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 Jesus says. But who do you men say that I am? And who spoke first? Peter. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus became emotional. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, Peter with his big mouth was filled with the Holy Spirit because you give fruits of the Spirit. Jesus himself confirms only my Father which is in heaven could have revealed that to you. Because up till now, Jesus was telling people, see that thou tellest no one. He would keep it a secret. His signs and wonders all over the public, not all of them got out. And he would tell people, don't say this. Don't tell anyone. But Peter could see that the divine hand was upon this rabbi. He was the Messiah. He was demonstrating it. And so... There are just so many examples of Peter in the ministry of Jesus. We just don't have time to go through them, but I'll, I'll go through another one just to remind you. Um, one night they're crossing the sea, and Jesus is deathly tired. Have you ever been so exhausted that you sleep through anything? I slept through my first earthquake in L.A. My bed rolled around the room, and I slept through it. <laughs> my mom says, did you guys feel the quake this morning? No. How come you didn't wake us up? Mom, I thought you loved us. We've been wanting to feel an earthquake all our lives. That isn't right. I want to feel the earthquake. Ah. The next week, February 9, 1971, when my window exploded and shredded the curtains and glass spattered against the wall across the room, and when my bed flew across the room and slammed against this wall and bounced the back over here, and I was thrown off my bed on the next roll because the ground went up three feet and then it fell four feet. <laughs> there was no confusion about my mom. 
And as this massive explosion and 100,000 windows shattering in one second in the entire community, as the gas pipes exploded in the streets outside, suddenly it stopped rolling 50 seconds later. And my mom says, it's an earthquake! <laughs> Thanks, Mom! <laughs> and I remember trying to get to the center door frames as I watched our garage hopping away all by itself. Do not ever desire this phenomenon in your journey. Let me tell you, it's the end of a perfect day. You see, Peter... And the disciples and Jesus are out in the sea and this massive violent storm comes up and Jesus is so deathly tired, he's asleep. The boat is taking on water. They're about to sink. The water level's up here and it's lapping over easily. They're bailing water as fast as you can. And Jesus is back there. I know it's embarrassing, but he was so tired. He was asleep. Who woke him? Peter. Master! <laughs> Master! Don't you care that we're going to die? The Messiah, the Savior of the world, is in the boat with them. And these guys are afraid of dying. Explain this to me. He who participated in the creation of the world is in the boat with them, and they're afraid of dying. Just who do we think we are when we lack faith and stop believing in a Savior when He is with us all along? Jesus, well, what do you do when you're waking up at 3 in the morning, huh? <laughs> As He accidentally gulps water, <clears throat> He stands up and sloshes in the boat, and He tells the sea, stop it! Be still! <laughs> Turns into glass. I remember I was out fishing with my little Pomeranian dog. He's this size, with hair this long, so he's this size. <laughs> when you get him wet, <laughs> just needs a little tail to be a rat. And he barks, <laughs> He thinks he's big. <laughs> he doesn't know that with one boot you can send him halfway down the street. He doesn't know that. He's convinced that you're terrified. <laughs> oh, look how cute. <laughs> and they go right at your pan like, whoa, your dog has issues. <laughs> and I turn to him and I say, thank you. <laughs> My kids love him. His name is Osito, little bear. He thinks he's an actual little bear. He thinks he's a Kodiak. He thinks he's nine feet tall. Um, anyway, he was with me on the boat. And the water was so still, I had just caught a seven-pound largemouth black bass, big enough to swallow him. <laughs> so I knew what was out there. He was sitting there. <laughs> he saw glass. He's thinking, I can run. <laughs> he jumps in. <laughs> now my little rat is swimming, and I'm thinking of the black bass down below. Oh, food, man. <laughs> I've got nightmares going on. My, my dog's about to be eaten. I ended up having to jump in to retrieve this dog. <laughs> well, what was I going to tell my children? I, Sweetheart, I don't know how to tell you, but a fish ate the dog. <laughs> I mean, that's as bad as the dog ate my homework. They would never believe it, you know. And so I, I jumped in for love of my children and gathered this little rat who couldn't believe that there was nothing to run on out there. It just, he just, when Jesus said, stop it, be still, it really did stop. And it got still. And he says to these men, how is it that you have so little faith? You see, faith is about believing. When you do what you've accepted as truth, 
if you have the Savior of the universe on board with you, how can you be afraid of dying? Wow. Peter learned another lesson. It just goes on and on. He walked on water on another occasion. Remember, Moses and Joshua walked through the water. Peter walked on the water. That's pretty seriously different. And then the night came when Jesus was arrested. And a woman said, You're one of them. What? You're a disciple. You're one of the Talmudids. By now, he was very famous. Peter was the mouth. Yeah, have you seen Jesus, the Nazarene, who's been preaching about that incredible prophet, that rabbi? No, but we've heard of that Talmudin at his side, that guy Peter, the guy with the mouth. Peter was the most famous of the disciples. His mouth went before him. And so this girl recognizes him. You're one of the disciples. And Jesus said, what? Disciple? I don't know what you're talking about. And off in the distance, there's this red rooster that should have retired long ago, but nobody's told him. So finally somebody else says, you are him. You just cut my cousin's ear off up at the garden. It was you. I'll never forget you, man. It was you. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. And finally someone else says later on that night, even the way you talk, you talk like a Christian. Oh, yeah? Well, check this out. And he started throwing out these huge words with only four letters in them. And people were like, this is Peter. Everybody, that's Peter, right? Yeah. He's cussing us out. <laughs> if someone ever accuses you of being a Christian, maybe it's because they have evidence to prove it. Don't deny the Messiah. Don't ever be embarrassed. Somebody once made fun of me. <laughs> so you're one of those hallelujah types, right? I go, as a matter of fact, yeah. Huh? You can tell this guy wasn't used to that. His friends who had been laughing with him, <laughs> he's an hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, I am, dude. You know what hallelujah means? Praise the Lord. Check it out. Oh, I, 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 I didn't realize. I, yeah, dude, have you tried it? No, I, I have. Then how come you make fun of it if you haven't tried it? You haven't checked it out for yourself? Well, I don't know. I haven't. And then his friends, yeah, man, yeah. Why haven't you? It turned around. Don't ever be ashamed of Jesus. Don't ever be ashamed. And if they laugh, laugh with them. Yeah, we'd all be happy. Now listen to me. I've met the Messiah. You see the power of it? Kids on the street are proud of it. Yeah, man. <laughs> Mescaline, man, forever. Kids are proud of it. Why can't we be proud of Jesus? Same kid gives his life to the Lord, her life to the Lord. Look at the power of the difference of someone who declares for me to live. Is Jesus. Now, Peter denies Jesus now, cussing everybody out for the third time, and, and, and everybody... <coughs> and we're told that at that moment, his eyes met with Jesus' eyes. And something happened. Jesus looked at him with love. How often had his big mouth gotten in the way? And now he's denying the man that he loves so much. Even if you love the Lord, we are capable of making big mistakes. We can fall flat on our faces. We can do terrible sins. And at that moment you look into his eyes, he does not condemn you. He invites you to repent. And Peter ran out of that place. He went up to Gethsemane, to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus was arrested. And there were the rocks still stained with the blood that came from the pores of Jesus. Peter wept bitterly. The next day was horrible as the Messiah was led to a cross. And on the place of the skull, he was crucified to his horror. It was too late to apologize. And then about the sixth hour, he sees him die. And the sky grew dark. And the earth trembled. The death of the Messiah. The death. The prophet was right. A suffering servant. And we... We looked at him and esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb. He was led to the slaughter. He didn't complain. Shabbat came upon them, 
as the Sabbath came, he was quickly deposited without ceremony, without oils, without any kind of holy prayers. And to let him go, he was born in a barn, and he was buried without ceremony. God's only Son was reduced to nothingness from the very beginning to the very end. He emptied Himself so that you and I can be filled. And that Shabbat was the longest Sabbath of their lives. And I could just see Peter among the other disciples. We heard what you did, man. You're going to cuss us out too, dude? You know, you have a mouth. You know that? You guys, I already feel bad. Hey, man, get to your corner, man. We're going to take this to the church board. We've had enough of you. The church manual is specific on people like you. I've already had a conversation with the pastor and the first elder forever and ever. Amen. Poor Peter. But Sunday morning. A few things fell over. What was that? I don't know. And a few minutes later, there's a woman hitting at the door. Soldiers, they've come to arrest it. No, it's Mary. Hey, tell her this is no time for prayer. Get her out of here. She's insisting she's about to kick the door down. You don't get in the way of a sister who has seen Jesus. You get out the way, gentlemen. Because if she's seen a Savior, you're going to be converted by the end of the day. You can run, but you can't hide. And if your mother is praying for you, give up. Because <laughs> the Lord hears her prayers. The prayers of a mother for her children rise as sweet savor before the presence of God Almighty. She wasn't going to stop until that door was open, whether it was naturally or unnaturally kicked down with her sandals. She was only 105 pounds, but you, that 300-pound door better open in a hurry. She came in... <laughs> I just saw it. I thought it was Mr. Rodriguez, the gardener, you know? And, and I went up, Mr. Rodriguez, you see everything. Just tell me where they took him. And he turned around and he says, Mary, only Yeshua pronounced my name like that. He's alive. And he told me to tell you guys, if you want to see him, go to Galilee. Okay? All right, we'll see you guys. Mary, it's been rough on all of us, sweetheart. Don't, don't you touch me. I've already seen him, you men of little faith. Excuse me, I got to get to Galilee. And Sister Mary took off. See, gentlemen, you listen to her if she has seen the Messiah for herself. Ladies, the power of your faith, do not underestimate it. There was a woman whose husband was not converted, and Paul says, your faith justifies the home. Be strong and of a good courage, ladies, for the Lord has given you a gift. Use it in the name of the Lord. So Jesus appears to them in the last chapter of the book of John, and, in, and, and they've been fishing all night. They were waiting for him in Galilee, and nothing, you know how it is in fishing. There was a guy who told his wife, why do you always go to the mall? You never buy anything. And she says, why do you always go fishing? You never catch anything. And she, <laughs> It's rough when you argue with a sister whose mind is made up, you know, and even if it's true, it's fun to go shopping, okay, so you only bought an orange juice, but it was great looking at all those blouses that you can't afford, and you say, wow, wow, and you just do that all afternoon, wow, and guys, wow, wow, even though you didn't catch anything, it was exciting, you know, Yeah, the salmon are running, but they're just staring at my lure. They're not taking it for anything. <laughs> Look at that. Don't you hate it, gentlemen, when the fish comes to watch you? <laughs> hey, you guys, he's fishing. <laughs> and the two or three trophies are sitting there watching you. <laughs> Jesus says, cast the net on the other side. And as these men in slow motion you could see water ruffling from all directions 
as if whales were coming toward them. <laughs> so many fish, hundreds of them. Trophies were, everybody's rent and food were covered for the rest of the month. And as Peter feels bad, it's John, who, you know, John was a teenager. And the, it's the master man for sure. And Peter says, you guys go on ahead. You could tell he feels bad. And he's jumping in, and as he realizes that the net's about to tear, uh, come on back, you guys. We're going to need help with this. And they struggle to pull in the biggest haul of fish ever in their careers. Meanwhile, Jesus had a campfire going. Morning Star Farms. <laughs> Grillers and veggie fish with uh, whole wheat bread. <laughs> he had fish and tortillas. <laughs> they call it pita bread, but they submit it. It's just a big fat tortilla. And you know there must have been a jalapeno rolling around somewhere in that pan. <laughs> and they ate. Everyone ate plenty. Jesus cooked breakfast after his resurrection. He cooked breakfast for his guys. And as they ate, the crowd gathered from all places of Galilee. Those who had listened to the council, if you want to see me come to Galilee, they came in and they were looking at Yeshua. We saw you die. We watched you die. I told you that on the third day I would rise again. And he was able to reason with them the prophecies of the Messiah uh, found in Isaiah, uh, in Jeremiah, in Psalms, and the, the suffering servant, he that would come and die for his people. He would rise again. Then he'd come again to take them unto himself. And, and he, they were now experiencing two of the disciples that walked with him to Emmaus. Didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to us along the way? When Jesus opens the scroll, it was incredible. He was talking about himself. And so then he goes to Peter in front of everybody. Hey, Peter, you love me more than all these people? Master? And everybody, okay, you're going to cuss him out now too, dude? Master, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. <sighs> hey, by the way, Peter, do you love me more than these people? Master, what are you doing? I just want to know. You know I love you. <laughs> Feed my lambs. Sheep? Lambs. Take care of my young people too. Then he asked him for the third time, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. I love you. You know I love you. I know I missed them. Feed my sheep. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? How many times did Jesus give him an opportunity to reestablish himself publicly? He will forgive you. No matter what you've done, he'll forgive you of your sins. He'll cleanse you of unrighteousness. Repent and ask for forgiveness. And you will get to know the Messiah more and more. He becomes he, your Messiah, your Savior, not just that person's Savior, not just that person's Savior. He becomes your Messiah. This week we have talked about checking Him out for yourself so that He can become your Savior. Isn't it time that He become ours? Why does He always have to be somebody else's Savior? Why do I have to buy a book to see how He has saved someone else when He could be saving me? Why do I have to be inspired reading a magazine article and still feel hopeless for myself? Isn't it time that you believe in something? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. He that has the Son hath life. He that does not have the Son does not have life. Do you want Him in your life? Amen. You see, it's powerful. It's simple. It's least common denominator. It's one plus one equals two. A child can understand that. It was the great uh, theologian, I believe it was Bart, who, you know, taking John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, same was in the beginning with God. And then it talks, like verse, later verse says, says, and the Word was made flesh. You know, Jesus was made flesh. And then he says, and then it took a bunch of theologians to turn him back into words again. 
And as a prominent theologian, he had the right to make that quip. Sometimes of Jesus is just a bunch of words for us, and we argue and have fights in our churches. Shame on us. It is time to quit arguing Jesus. It is time to start experiencing Him. We are foretold that there would be a final movement. A final movement where the Lord does miracles, where He saves His people from their sins. Jesus is about to come. The signs are fulfilling. My counsel to you is quit worrying about times of trouble. We spin ourselves into a, a, a terror made up of our own doing that freezes us from experiencing the Messiah in our lives. And then we don't share Him because we're busy worried about running into the mountains. Well, which mountain are you going to register at? Because they do charge at the gate. Those of us who have been through some times of trouble, who have been chased, who've been fired on with weapons, who've been held at bay against a wall with weapons, some of us have discovered that God has a way of delivering His people. And even the message of the time of trouble, I have read repeatedly that it's a message of deliverance. It was at midnight that God chose to deliver His people. So where did we turn it into Sabbath the 13th, our own horror movie, where we scare each other? into paralysis instead of activity for the Savior. The Lord did not prophesy a final movement of frightened people. The Lord prophesied a final movement of people who have met the Lord Jesus Christ, are living His Ten Commandments in 28 fundamental ways. They are living Jesus. We believe in something. Distinctive truths that are not just arguments to beat other people over the head with. Distinctive truths that are seen in our lives. Does that make sense to you? It's been foretold. You don't have to agree, but God is already mounting His movement. And it is my joy to invite you to be a part of this movement. Some have not been baptized. And it's time for you to make that commitment of your life. This is our last meeting tonight. And the churches of the Eugene area and throughout this great valley you will continue the seeds that were sown in this series, and great will be the harvest that is yet to come in this place. Because now you know it is possible to fill an arena. You must now also know that it is possible to fill the stadium down the street. It is time, church. It is time to believe in something. And all things are possible to them that believe. If I have seen over 36,000 baptisms in the last four years, one thing I can tell you is that I have done absolutely nothing. I just got to drive my combine through other people's fields. I've got to see with my own eyes what God is doing around the world, including the United States of America, including Canada, including the countries of Europe, including Australia, places that say it's too difficult to bring a soul to Jesus. Don't tell the Holy Spirit what He's able to do and what He's not able to do. It is time to believe. All things are possible to them that believe. And to my friends in the Jewish community, in this community, the people of God, the Messiah has come and He wants to live in us. He wants to share Him. Share Him with all. This is our time. Be courageous. Be strong. For this battle is not ours. It's whose? It's the Lord. So as I sing this song, as I sing this song, if you want to give your life to the Lord in baptism, come forward. If this is your moment, you came not with that idea tonight, but you know the Lord has convicted you. Something is happening. I can tell you, I'm testifying what I've seen with my own eyes. I didn't read this anywhere. No one told me anything. I'm telling you what I've seen. God is up to something. He's doing something. And it includes all of us. Do you want to be a part of the movement? Give your life to Him. I want to be baptized. 
I want to prepare for that special service where I come into the water and die to the world and am born again for Jesus Christ. As I'm playing this song, come forward. Don't come forward because you're good. Come forward because God is good. Don't come forward because you're strong. Come forward because He is strong. Does this make sense? Be courageous. I'm going to sing, you come forward. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will never love and trust Him in His presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at His feet I bow. Oh, the joys of full salvation. Take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender. to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender, O Salvador, a Ti me rindo, obedezco solo a Ti. Todo encuentro, Cristo en ti. A tu causa me consagro y tu amor, mi amor será. Hoy oh, Cristo mi plegaria. surrender oh, sing with me you know this song I surrender oh, I surrender oh, all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender Savior, I surrender. 